Welcome to our latest edition of Get Connected at Work, where we talk about technology intersecting with business. I'm uh, your host, Mike Agarbo. And I'm Chris Pereira. Welcome. We have uh, got a really cool show today. Uh, we are going to be talking about the future of housing uh, and uh, building and building materials. We've got a great guest. His name is Oliver Lang. He is with Intelligent City. He is uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO. He's a recognized leader in design innovation and integration of complex urban projects. Things like mixed-use housing, advanced prefabrication, and green building strategies. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me, Mike. So we're going to be talking about uh, building new, uh, I guess, multi-unit uh, housing mixed-use uh, developments. Uh, how much has technology transformed this industry over the past 50 years? Uh, so far, very little. Okay. <laughs> um, there's really been almost no change uh, in applying technology, like the idea of you know using Industry 3.0, Industry 4.0, like we've seen in almost any other sector, hasn't made its way into the construction industry yet. But we're about to change that. So when we're looking at these buildings going up uh, in uh, urban settings like a Vancouver, Toronto, New York, they're still using the same type of technology and uh, I guess ways they've been building buildings. Uh, for the past 50 years? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of them are uh, concrete high rises. There's definitely been advancements done in the use of some of the you know, software technology, uh, project management maybe, but not in the, in the actual construction technology. A lot of the buildings are built one-off buildings, they're custom buildings every single one at a time, um, and uh, built from there. So the idea of taking um, construction into uh, advanced manufacturing, automation, deploying of robotics or artificial intelligence. None of these things have really made themselves into the construction sector. I, th I thought that was already happening, but <laughs> I guess not. So, so tell us about Intelligent City before we get into some of the meat here. Yeah, so Intelligent City is a housing technology company. We started in about 2008 to respond to some of what we thought were sort of urgent needs in, in, in our sector to, uh, to deliver uh, more affordable, more sustainable housing. Um, what I think is unique about our company that we, we've done it on the basis of creating a uh, scalable and adaptable product that uh, is using a, a, a fairly broadly and de uh, deeply integrated technology platform. Um, so we're, we're um, creating sort of a turnkey housing product. You can come to us and you can deliver a, a mixed use uh, multifamily um, building for, you know, right now mostly for affordable rental housing. So four to 18 stories for urban densification. That's our, our sweet spot um, right now. And uh, we've got, uh, we've built some projects, we've manufactured, and we're now going in advanced uh, manufacturing automation. Yeah. Oliver, when I'm hearing uh, modularized and uh, intelligent design, what I'm thinking is either uh, Lego blocks or uh, IKEA instruction kits. Is that along the lines of sort of making things more standardized, so laid out and you can put it together in half the time now that it's uh, smarter in the preparation stages or how? Yeah, in, in simple terms, yes. I mean, the idea is to, to come up with a, uh, a system that can be rapidly assembled with great predictability and where we can do a lot of quality control and, um, and, and integrate it in a way that, that it really suits the needs of people. Right. And also with, uh, with technology, like you said, it's not being used yet in the industry, but uh, in my mind, thinking of, about other industries, it's all about collecting the information about what's available and analyzing how to do it uh, in the most effective and efficient way possible when you're constructing the, uh, the building itself. So I see sort of, is that where the opportunities are in the future, and using resources more effectively? Or? Yeah, definitely. We have to use resources more effectively. We have to we have to address a, a number of, of, of major issues and problems. One is, you know, a urban housing affordability crisis that's there everywhere. So we have to find a way through scaling, through learning, through systemic innovation um, to deal with uh, the the cost of construction, the spiraling cost of construction for sure. Um, we have to address climate change. Um, and so our, our buildings are trying to be carbon neutral today. They use something that's called passive house technology. That means they're highly energy efficient buildings that reduce your cost of heating and, and operating. Um, we're thinking about the longevity and the life cycle of buildings uh, in, in increasingly. So I think there are, there are some issues that, uh, that, that we need to address. And uh, we've built that sort of into the, into the uh, uh, you know, DNA of, of our it sounds like it's approach. pretty uh, software heavy. Is there, a, is there a learning curve for, for construction 
uh, workers or people in, in the industry needing to know no coding, for example, or what, how do you how do you get a person used to a hammer and nails used to something more more advanced? So it's interesting. I mean, I think there's a there's an incredible opportunity, um, and and actually the the premier and and, and the, the BC uh, government has just made announcements to uh, to embrace the idea of um, mass timber construction, like like we're doing it uh, more broadly, um, because there's so much experience. There, right, We've got a lot of carpenters, Absolutely. a lot of very very good construction workers, and and I think if you can give them the opportunity to add value to a fantastic product and work in a safe uh, manufacturing environment, bring all their knowledge into this um, and then learn, you know, and retool them on, on advanced automation equipment and robotics and so forth. Uh, I think it can create some, some fantastic jobs. Um, and yeah, I mean, people need to be trained on it, but that's totally doable. I hope the instructions are better than the IKEA manuals. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we basically create a full virtualization of the entire construction process, the, the entire choreography of how, how the buildings will come together. Right. So just breaking that down right now, when you look at some of these multi-story buildings, uh, most of them or many of them are made out of concrete. So, um, you know, they obviously develop all the, uh, the plans, the blueprints, and then the materials come to the site. Uh, and a lot of that has to be cut there or mixed there. Uh, but what you're saying now is that you're designing the buildings uh, using software and then you're I guess, prefabricating the, the pieces that get shipped to the site and then they put them together. There. Sure. And, yeah. and does that affect the cost in any way? Is it uh, more expensive, less expensive, about the same? Well, it's, it's correct what you're saying. So we're designing the entire system that you can then rapidly uh, assemble on site. It's all based on, on, on the idea of using mass timber components from the ground up commercial levels, offices, the residential parts, all can be done through the same system. Um, the cost is like with anything where you go into a, a process of sort of industrialization and you get scale. Now you can, you can leverage your supply chain. You get the benefit of running you know, robots at, that can move with total precision at two meters a second, like 16 hours a day. And you, you can now bring costs down. Like you, you know, we'll do it in any, pretty much any other industry we know. Um, we're doing this and um, that's really where you have the effect on savings. So faster, you have the automation, but then we've also, we look at it holistically. So we're designing the product and because we have a reliable response and the design overall, we've completely optimized the homes, for example. There's no wasted space in them anymore, right? So if you can have pay rent on a 550 square foot apartment that meets all your needs instead of having to rent 750 or 800 square feet without any gain, that's more affordable, right? So it's, it's really the approach of while looking at efficiencies, integration, speed of construction, manufacturing efficiencies, automation. Um, there isn't a single answer. There's no silver, single silver bullet. It is really these compounding effects um, that looking at, at the entire model of how do we deliver housing today that we need to change and that we're trying to. So, I mean, we, we brought up the words modular housing, but when I think of modular housing, these are kind of prefab units that basically get delivered to a site. You're just, I guess, delivering the, the, the pieces to it and they assemble it there. Yeah. yeah. Mod modular housing has been around for over 100 years now. Um, and um, that's always really the, you know, you built the box, it's the one fits all, and it, it's, it's not very adaptable. It doesn't, it's, you know, it, it doesn't work uh, very well in higher um, um, assembly, like higher multi-story assemblies. Um, they, they've built some modular housing projects now, you know, uh, over 30 stories tall, but it's not ideal for it. And the real problem is it's just not very adaptable yeah. um, to, to people's needs. And if we learn one thing, you know, one day, uh, you know, look at COVID, all of a sudden we're all working from home, right? The demographic needs are changing, cities are changing. We need more adaptable models so that buildings can stay uh, future-proof for a course of, you know, 70 or 100 years, uh, though we'd have to demolish them after 30 years, but, but keep them uh, viable. Um, so we need more adaptability in, in, in the construction system, and that's why we've decided, we did our first project also modular, but we've learned our lessons from it. You ship air, it's inefficient, it uses a lot of manufacturing space, it makes it unnecessarily expensive. So we've just taken all the good lessons from it, which is creating a building system that integrates all the services, all the design and engineering issues, and then you can flat pack it, ship it, and deploy it rapidly. When I think of prefab, like, is, are you losing any of the creativity of, you know, the design of the building? Are they all going to look the same? 
Well, I, I would think it's the opposite. Um, the, the problem is when you, I, I'm trained as an architect, right? So you come up with something that's beautifully creative, everybody screams, that means it's, it's gonna be very expensive and the value engineering is gonna go through it and all the, the, the nice design features get, uh, get value engineered out. We have the possibility by having a, a consistent, predictable, de-risked platform that we can now bring all the, the, the values of design of better livability, you know, more beautiful spaces, um, a consistent detailing like you would have. You have an expectation. We all have expectations from any industrial design product that we use, right? Be that our smartphone, our cars, our, you know, stereo, or whatever that might be, or furniture, that they're beautifully designed and nicely put together. But we don't have that expectation with buildings. Yeah. So that opportunity we have now is to actually bring them together in a, in a, in a you know, high quality paradigm. Well, I, can, I can hear the passion in your voice when you're talking about the architecture and uh, designing buildings. If there's, if there's a young person listening to this who's equally passionate about this and thinking about getting in the industry, what, what advice would you have for, I guess, what, what should they study these days? And uh, what, what, what's uh, coming down the five, 10 year time frame in terms of more changes in the industry and how should they prepare to follow that career path? These days. Well, I think you should definitely follow their passion. I mean, if you come through it through architecture or engineering or software design or material science or environmental technology or urban development or economics, um, that, that doesn't really matter. I think there, there are the many ways into this sort of sector that, that we're working in. Um, but I would, I would highly recommend to try, to try to have sort of a bit of hybrid knowledge because I think the specialization really doesn't serve anybody well anymore. I think we need, you know, like in our company, everybody is either a designer and a software engineer or an engineer and, and understands environmental technologies or understands manufacturing design and robotics and software, right? So you need to be able to bridge these gaps. Um, and, uh, and, and so, because that's the only way how we can integrate, right? So we have a really diverse team of people, every single one has that, that capability so that we can that we can make these advances and that we don't uh, any longer sort of argue from, you know, rigid, I mean, from rigid own. positions, right? We need to overcome, we need to leave these behind because we're, we're trying to embrace it. Yeah, I think the siloed paradigm. positions of different different sectors is uh, really going in the way of the dodo in a lot of ways with, with right. uh, tech in the next five or 10 years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about the building material just quickly because uh, something struck me with about how high you can make your buildings. You're using wood. Yep. And you said you can get up to 18 stories mm -hmm. using wood materials. Yep. Is there is that safe? I mean, you you've actually you're actually living in one of the the places that you made. I know it's not 18 stories, I think it's about four stories. Yeah, it's four. Yeah. yeah. You haven't lost any family members, it hasn't burnt down. <laughs> <laughs> No, these these uh, these these new materials, mass timber, you know, cross laminated um, mass timber that we're that we're using, is a is a very strong material, um, made and pressed into very large panels, um, and uh, it's 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 structurally, you know, effectively as strong as concrete. Um, it's fire resistant, um, which is which is fantastic, um, because it chars. Um, so that it will not it will not burn through, and and there are already plenty of precedents in the world. We have an 18-story building on the UBC campus, the so-called Brock Commons or Tallwood House. Um, that is an 18-story built today as a proof of concept. There's a 24-story building that just went up in Vienna. Um, so uh, we have plenty of examples everywhere already to point at. The material has been around for for well over 20 years, um, but it's only now that we're finally have the adoption, but, but you know, we're, we're, we're very uh, happy to see that the province in BC, um, the first to implement uh, what's called the encapsulated mass timber code, allowing for the construction of 12 story buildings in BC now. Wow. Right? So we can do that now everywhere. Perfectly safe. Yeah, it's perfectly safe. Yeah. Um, talking about the green aspect, uh, we hear that term used all the time uh, in construction. Now everyone wants a green building. Yep. Uh, but I think there's a lot of variations of that, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I appreciate anybody who's trying from ever, any angle, trying to make the buildings uh, greener. Um, the, what does it mean to you to make a green building? For us, it really means we, we need to get a building that really has no more, places no more burden on this planet. Right? We want buildings that are, that are effectively carbon and energy neutral. And that's what we've designed our, our system for. Um, and, and we know through our own studies that we can be carbon neutral today. And the, the, only, the only challenge 
um, that the real challenge that we have left is the amount of underground parking that some municipalities uh, require us to supply um, because that has to still be built on a concrete for you know, uh, dam proofing and, and, and structure and, and so forth there. But everything above ground, um, we can now build, even in a, in a mixed use building with commercial and offices and so forth, we can build it all from our system and um, that is all carbon neutral today. Who would your customer be? I mean, you have the software aspect that helps design the buildings. Uh, you make the actual panels uh, and what have you. I mean, who, who do you target? Is it uh, governments? Uh, is it uh, the developers, builders themselves? Yeah, it's, it's landowners. It's uh, developers, people who want a rental housing project, nonprofits who want affordable rental housing um, because we can develop, you know, we can deliver a, a turnkey solution. So typically uh, developers, landowners, um, uh, you know, universities for faculty and student residences. Those are our, our, our primary uh, You know, when I was right looking there. around downtown Vancouver, every now and then you see the buildings with the trees on top of the buildings yep. and the, the green spaces up there. Why, why, are we, why does not every building have just forest on top of the buildings? Yeah, very good question. Yeah. Yeah. So we, when, we, when we started out uh, um, 12 years ago and we sort of designed that, base principle about the building, we said that needed to be really good livability in the mm -hmm. buildings, right? Um, because we thought a building will not be sustainable if people don't love it, if people don't embrace it, and it has to be designed for the, for the end user, um, having the great livability, having courtyards, having a lot of green space, amenity space, rooftop gardens, urban agriculture, these kind of things shouldn't just be a dream, they should just be built into yeah. what we do on we a daily clear basis. We like Vancouver used to be a forest once upon a time, if we had trees above the the city, it's basically a reforested yep. area in essence, isn't it? Well, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a rooftop garden right now and enjoy it almost every night, right? Okay. And it's just so beautiful to, to be there. You enjoy the views you've got there. You can, you know, you can get your uh, fingers in the dirt for a little <laughs> bit, just enough to keep you happy right? yeah. without having to mow the lawn every night. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and you have a, a really good sense of your neighbors. And uh, so there, there's a way of designing buildings to, uh, to create that, that sort of social um, resilience in a building in a way, the, 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 the qualitative aspect of urban livability so that we can embrace the idea of living in a city and, and don't want any longer to commute out in the suburbs, right? Because that's sort of a, the other measure. Like when you talk about sustainability, there is the, um, uh, the, the inherent embodied carbons that we have in building that we're trying to address with the timber then there's the operational carbons that we're trying to address through our high performance building envelopes that we prefabricate, like passive house compliant. And then there's the behavioral carbon that we need to address because the reason why people commute so much is because they're just not happy. Some of them are not happy. They feel that there's, there's just no place in the city to raise kids, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it's not a proper home. You don't want to just live in a condo and be, you know, come out on an elevator and walk down a, a dark corridor and be number 12 on a door, right? And just be a unit. You want a home. So we used to say from the beginning, we have to design homes that people are really happy with. There's plenty of access to daylight, natural ventilation, good acoustics, privacy, but also connection to your neighbors, to outdoor space. You know, we have these courtyards, and rooftop gardens and so forth. So all of that has been sort of baked into the, 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 the overall approach into the DNA of the system. And then we designed the construction systems and the manufacturing systems around uh, those things, because we believe unless you make it desirable, people won't adopt it. And if they won't adopt it, then you create another you know, environmental no, problem. Exactly. You're literally building the future with what you're doing. So I think it's fantastic. Uh, one last question. Uh, you've obviously used technology a great deal uh, with uh, what you're doing and not only designing the buildings, uh, prefabricating all the pieces, what are some challenges that still exist that you're hoping technology can help solve? So um, we, we need to work you know, hard on the, on the overall public perception of uh, innovation in general. I mean, as you can imagine, buildings are some of the most costly things that a client can invest in, a municipality or a university or whoever wants to order a building. You know, building can be easily 20, 50, 100 million dollars. Um, so that's a big bill. And, and I think the, what, what the technology can help us is, is really paving the path to de-risking the implementation of, of these projects and getting, you know, all the testing, all the certification issues, all of these things out of the way and using the, the virtualization of it um, there. 
Uh, the next thing is really scaling up. So we're, we're you know, we've, we've had our first manufacturing plant that, you know, was basically analog. Now we're building a new plant where, where we have all the automation and robotics working in it. And then the point now, the next step after that is scaling. So we need to be able to, to replicate that plant and its full functionality into other jurisdictions so that we could be economy of scale. We've been talking all about technology and how it's uh, integrating into the construction world and uh, development of uh, new multi-use housing. I want to thank uh, Oliver Lang for joining us today. Thank you. Oliver uh, is, uh, again, the co-founder and CEO of Intelligent City. Uh, what's uh, the website address where people can find out more info? Oh, it's uh, www.intelligent-city.com. Perfect. Of course, you can uh, check out uh, a whole lot more at getconnectedmedia.com. Uh, again, thanks to Oliver. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Mike Nagarbo. And I'm Chris Pereira. Thanks again. We'll see you again next time.